Yes, indeed, this is the end game for this trial. 28 days. Testimony is now finished. And yes, the jury has it in our hands. Welcome to our simulcast here on WSAV and WCBD. I'm Andrew Davis along with Riley Benson. Yeah, certainly glad to have you with us tonight. Andrew, we just started this deliberation process not too long ago, maybe more, a little over an hour. And obviously now it's kind of a waiting game. We have no idea how long this process could take. It could be the next five minutes or we could be here in the next week. So a lot of uncertainty right now, but you know, let's talk about some of the closing arguments we got to hear today though. It was really interesting to see obviously both sides making that last push for final votes mm -hmm. or to make sure the last thing they get in their brain out there for those jurors was what they wanted and, and defense hit especially hard on the investigation and yeah. the fact that Alec shouldn't have been the only suspect. You know, Andrew, not a lot of surprises. Jim Griffin, Dick Carpullian have been pushing on this investigation, how it was handled throughout the last five and a half weeks. We've heard it time and time again, much like the state has pushed financial crimes, the defense has pushed on this investigation. And we heard about this mistrust for law enforcement. Alec Murdoch says he had for SLED. We heard about that again today. Certainly not a lot of surprises from Jim Griffin in his closing argument. No, absolutely. We'll hear from Jim right now so you get a taste of exactly what he had to say. Alex, his financial house is a wreck. He's stealing money from clients. He, he's got to produce a financial statement, maybe, in a hearing coming up. And his dad goes back in the hospital that day. His dad goes back in the hospital that day, and he ultimately dies a few days later. Okay. So I get a call. Jeannie comes in. My dad's going to the hospital. Paul's coming home. That would be a good time to kill Paul, wouldn't it? That is their theory of the case. And if you don't accept that beyond a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen, I submit the verdict has to be not guilty. Because there's no reason for him to do it. No reason whatsoever. The oath you've taken in this case is to follow the law. To follow the Constitution and to hold the government to the burden of proof. And it requires a verdict of not guilty. On behalf of Alex, on behalf of Buster, on behalf of Maggie, and on behalf of my friend Paul, I respectfully request that you do not compound a family tragedy with another. Thank you. Well, while Riley and I feel like we're legal scholars now after being in the court for 28 days, we brought in somebody who actually has a degree, Sean Kent, who's been a prosecutor, been a defense attorney so far. Give me a sense of Jim Griffin's defense today and what you thought of it. Um, as I said yesterday, I thought it was a little long, um, but there's a lot of points and a lot of things he had to get through so you can almost understand why it's so long. He had the hard job of trying to break that case up in three parts. One, they had to explain the lies. Two, after they explain the lies, they have to explain the science, who else could have done it, and they could have had to explain why. And so for the lies, I think they went with that oi addiction, could explain the lies, but any person with common sense will say, well, if he's hopped up on drugs, then how do you know he didn't do it? And that's when they went into the science to attract, well, somebody else could have done it, and SLED did a bad job. Yeah. So. So, you know, we talked about the emotion of this testimony, or this closing argument earlier, about how Jim got really upset, kind of crying, but you said one thing that you would have liked to see him not doing is reading from his notes, almost like it was a scripted emotion. Yeah, I understand the emotion. I definitely get it. Jim knows his family. He represented Paul Murdoch. Um, he knows them well. And when a lawyer can look at a jury and look in their faces and show some genuine emotion, it's very powerful. It's not powerful if we have notes and you're reading directly from it. So it's very odd to see this genuine emotion, but at the same time you're reading a script and the jury's watching you read a script. So that fell flat for me. And then that was interesting because that transitioned right into what the prosecution did. And your guy, John Metters, you've done a bunch of cases with him on either side against and for on this case. And he came out with a lot of emotion, a lot of interesting topics, and really just a completely different style than anybody else in the courtroom. Andrew, certainly, you know, Creighton Waters, not the energy guy for the prosecution. So John Metters, a whole different vibe when he took over today. I think we want to take you inside the courtroom and get a listen to what that sounded like today. But certainly a whole different aspect is John Metters tried to put a really a bow on this case. I want you to take a listen. And I find it offensive that the defense, through the defendant, who was also a part-time solicitor, is claiming that law enforcement didn't do their job, listen to me, please, didn't do their job while he is withholding and obstructing justice by not saying, 
I was down at the kennels. What did Alex not do? They showed a tape there. He's asking the sheriff, I think, call Buster. First time he tried to call Buster, that was, took the sheriff a while to get out there. You know when the first time he called Buster? It's about 40 minutes. Well, actually, he texted him, didn't even call him. Wasn't his first thought. Wasn't the thing after he did 911. It was later. Perhaps even when some of his friends had gotten there. They, oh, don't call. No, right off the bat, this happened. Call my son. Call him. Buster, stay where you are. You with your girlfriend? Up there in North Charlotte? Go, go, go. We got some people after us. That's what's real. John Metters may not be everybody's taste out there when it comes to lawyers, but I think it's really interesting to see how much attention he got from the jurors. Sean, you talked to me a little bit about this before. Is it the different style? Is it just he's right there in your face? What is it? He can be a lot. I've tried a lot of cases with him. He's very country, he's very colloquial. He, 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 and he can be loud and thematic and dramatic. Um, but sometimes, and not to hearken a Jeb Bush energy uh, reference, but we got low energy coming. The juries want some excitement. They've been sitting here for six weeks and there's a lot of boredom. And he comes and he's in your face. He's loud. He's country. He's saying things that this Walterboro jury understands. So I think it was effective. Yeah. Go ahead. Sean, at times this has been talked about as a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle that the state is putting in front of the jurors. The jurors know how to put this jigsaw puzzle together. I mean, in your mind, over the four and a half hours of closing arguments from state prosecutors, did they give this jury enough direction to be able to put this 1,000 jig piece jigsaw puzzle together? Yeah, yeah, they, they did, did, but they had it wrapped in so much it was hard to follow. They gave them enough. They gave them enough ammunition, but let's be honest, they gave them that ammunition for six weeks. You didn't need four and a half hours to put it there. It could have been much more simple, but I think there was enough for the jury to look at and say, we can come with a conviction if they want to. Now, now we've already heard, heard that the jury has asked for monitors. Yeah. They want to start looking at some of the video out here, which I think is probably a good sign that they're taking this very responsibility very seriously out there. When you hear that, Sean, what does that mean to you if you're, say, let's start from the prosecution side? Is that an exciting thing for you to know? 100%. If you're a prosecutor and you have a jury and they ask to see evidence, especially evidence that you pushed, you're in a great mood because they're revisiting the evidence that you wanted to push, and that puts you in a great mood. Your defense, you're not too excited about it. You know, I want to counter that. I think we're going to talk about that more in the next block, but Dick Harpooley and Jim Griffin walking through the Wildlife Center after this was sent to the jury, and one of the things they said is they also think the longer this goes, the better the case is for them, too. So they felt confident about the jury wanting to see some of this evidence. There's an old parlance. Defense lawyers always say the same thing. Defense lawyers want a long verdict. You want it drawn out. Because if that jury comes back quickly, it's a guilty. So you guys asked me in one segment, what is a defense lawyer thinking? A defense lawyer is thinking, please, God, don't let this jury come back in the next 30 minutes so I look like an idiot. The prosecutors want it quick. They want it over with. So I can understand what Jim and I... Dick or Thane, take weeks, take months. I don't think they'll take that long, but that's what they want. Absolutely. We have much more on the investigation. The trial is going on, what the jury is thinking. Also, we have an interview with Craig Melvin from the Today Show talking about the national perspective of this. And the mayor of Waltzboro yeah. gives us a really interesting local side. Yeah, certainly a lot going on here in Waltzboro the last five and a half <laughs> weeks. That light is at the end of the tunnel, but we'll hear more from the experts when we come Absolutely. Back. You're watching the trial of Alec Murdoch Endgame right here on WSAV and WCBD. We'll be right back with you. As it turns out, in fact, the state is the one that's been manipulating evidence to fit, fit their theories of guilt, which changed over time from the date of these murders until yesterday. In the absence of forensic science, a reliable investigation, the guns, blood spatter, the time and opportunity to have committed these murders, you're instead left to make inferences about all sorts of interactions and behaviors. Welcome back to the Alec Murdoch Endgame Special. And guys, we're talking about inside the courtroom today, defense attorney Jim Griffin, again talking about the integrity of the investigation into these murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. All trial, five and a half weeks, we've heard about the defense hammering how this investigation was handled, whether that be SLED or College and County. Andrew, we've talked about this a number of times, and, and Sean, certainly chime in here. How does this hold up, and, and what are your guys' take? Or Sean, what's your take on this investigation? And is this a, a viable defense to say that this wasn't handled properly? 
completely. You watch anything, you hear, especially what's going on nationally, bad police work. And so fundamentally, people right now aren't trusting police officers. So if you can find a defense lawyer to say, hey, guys, they haven't done their job. You can have a jury says, I don't care. I'm not siding with these officers who haven't done a good job right now. So that works well if you can show they've done a bad job. And there's nobody who's saying SLED did a great job in this case. They just did. Yeah. Attorney, Attorney Sean, Sean Ken has done Ken. both sides of this so far on, on either one. We talk about the prosecution and defense. When you get the jurors who are very focused as they were today, especially during Jim Griffin's testimony, they were leaning in. They were focused on that. Do you read a lot into that other than they just want to hear it? Or does that mean they're already leaning in that direction towards maybe letting Alec off? Oh, you 100 percent. You watch body language. You watch the jurors. Yesterday was one of the first days I was able to come in there and you watch them, their reaction to Creighton Waters. Um, I joke about a juror actually had a, brought a blanket with them. If you see a juror with a blanket and taking a nap, you have lost said juror. <laughs> so well, she had tissues, tissues in her ears. ears too, so. When that starts happening as a lawyer, you're like, yeah. oh my goodness, I've lost this juror. In the same respect, when you see that body language naturally move forward, that means they're interested in what you're saying. And so you're saying something that they want to hear. I mean, it's, it's good stuff. And, and you guys you know, know on the flip side of that, the state continuing to hammer away at this timeline. We're talking 8.49 to 9.02 p.m. is this timeline. They put Alec Murdoch at this scene. Alec says he wasn't there at 8.49. So, uh, Andrew, I mean, what's your thoughts on this timeline? And that's an extremely tight window. We're talking 13 minutes. You're talking 283 steps for Alec Murdoch. I think 59 for Maggie from 855 to 859. Eight. Yeah, so, it's, it's a very small timeline. Really, there's a yeah. four-minute segment in there as you're looking at it that really he's involved yeah. and says that he's there. He's with the dogs that are on the video. And then he continues on to go back. So it's about two minutes. And yet he can get in the house, apparently fall asleep, and not hear gunshots at the same time. So timelines like that, they had to hammer it, I'm sure, to make sure the jury understood it. I thought it was important. And what's great about this is you never see cases like this. The timeline was so good for both sides. The prosecutor, of course, used the timeline to say, who else could it be? And the defense used the same timeline to say, look, if it was him, how did he have time to clean himself up, get all of this biological material off of him, and then able to get inside of his car without making any transference whatsoever. So I thought the timeline worked really well for both parties so it was very interesting and how much to to both of these items obviously we kind of talked about that but which one of them maybe will be more strong for a jury is there something that they're going to pick out okay the timeline attracts my eye or okay the investigation sloppiness potentially catches my eye i mean is there something there that's stronger than the other for one side or the other juries hate bad police work they just do when somebody's life's on the line because you got to remember that jury's sitting back there and they're not talking heads like we are, they're about to decide if a man's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. And do you want to be a jury that puts a man in the rest of his life in prison over bad police work? Yeah. You know, and so you want to err on the side of believability that this man wouldn't execute his wife and son as opposed to ah, bad, bad police work. Let's just put him away and just hope they did it good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we want to talk about Brendan from your station from WCBD was just talking, talking about it. Had the question of this jury is completely different than when we started. They started with a set 12 people five alternates about now been placed into that jury it, that changes the complexion of everything doesn't it? it it's not the same jury i mean i, I love, love the question, question that, Riley, that came from your station. station and what ends up happening is when we're picking that jury two days of picking a jury you get the 12 people you automatically get lazy you just do and you're just throwing on alternates and you're like ah oh, we're never going to get to these five people they're going to get to every one of those alternates which is a scary theory for both the state and the defense absolutely almost can you talk about how we've seen it all really bomb threat we've seen covid we've seen <laughs> jurors removed i mean eggs we heard about a dozen yes, eggs dozen brought in eggs the... today they somebody brought eggs to the jury room. Cheap that... in the country, <laughs> you never know what you're going to get jury. I want an egg jury. and we'll have to talk about the next break O.J. Simpson somehow plays into this, too. I can't. I can't. Thank but anyways, you. when we come back, get a national perspective on this from Today Show and South okay. Carolina native Craig Melvin. He's going to talk to us exactly Certainly. about what this means for the area right now. We'll also get a local perspective, too. The mayor of Walterboro joining us here on our special to talk to us about how things have been in your Walterboro last five and a half weeks. Absolutely. We'll be right back with the trial of Alec Murdoch endgame when we return. is it about this that's drawn too many people in? You know, I'd say that's, that's a really good question, Andrew. I, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think that you've got, of course, the, 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 the Murdoch 
dynasty. I mean, folks who are from this area uh, have known that name for generations. I, th I think the fact that you've got uh, someone who has been so central to the fabric of this community for so long at the center of an unthinkable crime um, and and there are lots of unanswered questions. I mean, a lot of times in cases like this, it's kind of open and shut. This isn't one of those cases. I always find it fascinating in cases like this, high profile cases, the things that we've been obsessing over for weeks, months, the jurors could care less. I mean, it's not something they devote a lot of, of thought time to. I, I'm, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing from, from these jurors after the verdict about what moved the needle for them. What was that one piece of evidence? Or what were the pieces of evidence that caused them to, to vote the way they did? You've got the politics, you've got the money, you've got the old South, you've got, I mean, it's just, you know, Grisham could not have scripted something uh, quite like this. That was South Carolina's own Craig Melvin from the Today Show today, yeah. who was actually in Walterboro earlier this week. Welcome back to the trial of Alec Murdoch Endgame. We're here with Sean Kent, our legal expert, as well as Riley Benson from WCBD. My name is Andrew Davis from WSAB in our simulcast right now. Yeah. National perspective, this thing is the nationwide moment. Walterboro, the center of the legal nation right and now. Andrew, you got a chance to talk with Craig Melvin. I want to bring in now Mayor Bill Young. We have to set the record straight. This is not John Grisham. <laughs> this is Mayor Bill Young, the mayor here of Walterboro. Mayor Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, obviously, we heard about the national perspective and all eyes really on Walterboro, South Carolina. So, you know, that begs the question to you. I mean, obviously, we think that things have been so smooth and everything's been great in town. But from your perspective, how has Walterboro handled such a trial with so many eyes on it? Well, you know, we really didn't know what to expect. And um, as one of the lawyers said today in, in court, he said, uh, this trial has brought the world to Walterboro. And so, uh, we knew that we would have an influx of people. We knew we would have a lot of media here, and, and so we, we tried to prepare for that as best we could to make sure we accommodated those of you who are here working, um, that we were able to have food for you and those kinds of things, internet access, all of those things that, that you need, that, that the media needs. And then as far as the, uh, the rest of it, the, you know, the clerk of court has done an outstanding job um, preparing all of the court things and the sheriff Buddy Hill and all of his deputies have provided security done an outstanding job Scott Grooms with the city has kind of been your media person and uh, and I think they've all worked together well is there a sense of how much money maybe this has brought into Walterboro during the six-week period you know I know that it's had an impact and we will be able to you know as 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 we check um, hospitality taxes and um, accommodations taxes in the future during this period we'll be able to see kind of exactly how much impact it's had but i know from talking to people it, it is having an impact well mayor we've had some interesting things we had eggs come in today through the jury we've had oj simpson somehow comment on this trial which as sean says he can't even go there so far it's been such an interesting time but the one thing to go back to what it is i mean yeah. no one thought this would be turn out to what it may be the question though going back to some of the legal sides and 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 mayor i know you have a legal background to you but we might have to go to sean on this one the words hung jury have come up a lot in a lot of people's minds and no one wants to think about that when they just started deliberations but where could that be or what happens next from there if, if there's a hung jury, jury. Um, and all that takes is, and you hear the phrase all the time, it only takes one, and it does. It takes one person who says, I believe he's guilty, or I believe they haven't proved their case. It just takes one. If that one person hangs and says, I'm not voting with the masses, they got to do the whole thing over again. Like, it's not a throw out, it's not start over. You've got to do the entire matter over again. Kind of quickly clarify, I mean, they can come out a couple of times before we get to the point of, I believe it's a dynamite charge, where then we're looking at this actually being a possibility. Right, what has to happen is the jury, jury first, first has got, got to say we're hung or we can't make a decision. They can't tell you what their numbers are. They can't say we're 10 to 2 or whatever that nature. But they have to come out and say, we can't make a decision. And then the judge is required to send them back, say, go try again. And if they come back out another time, then the judge can give what's called an Allen charge or the dynamite charge. And it basically is that. It's dynamite. The judge looks at that jury and says, dang it, go back here. We got to do this again if y'all can't come up with a decision today. And it usually works. Yeah. Mayor, are you ready for six more weeks of trial if that has to come up? 
Well, I guess we, we, will, we will do our best. <laughs> it's, it's okay. We're all hoping that it's going to come to a verdict as well. Trust me on that one. So a lot still to come. The yeah. jury now still out as we speak and yeah. staying for a couple more hours tonight. Sounds like possibly it could go 8 to 10 o'clock tonight, and then they'll be back tomorrow. Maybe 4 o'clock is what we're hearing. They'll cut tomorrow. And the, the weekend is really up in the air at this point, right? Yeah. And we will be here yeah. the whole way as soon as the verdict comes out. We will be right with you here on WCBD and WSAV with that verdict for you, as well as full coverage on all our newscasts and web online. Yeah. We're also doing a Facebook chat at 615 right here on the WSAV page and I believe the CBD page Certainly. as well. We'll have more guests joining us for that too yes. to kind of take some of your questions and break this down more in depth. Absolutely. But thank you so much for joining us for Sean Kent, for the mayor, for Riley Benson. I'm Andrew Davis. Welcome back and thank you so much for watching the trial of Alec Murdoch Endgame.